Thank you so much. I am completely thrilled to be with you um, here today. And I have to say that what I'm talking about today is something that I'm talking about for the very first time. And I'm just so pleased to be able to do this with you today. So I'd like you to take just a second right now and look around you and find someone that you do not know or someone who you only know slightly. And you're going to do these, when I say go, you're going to do these three things. First, you're going to introduce yourself. Secondly, you're going to share with that person what you had for dinner last night. And you need to tell the truth. <laughs> and thirdly, I'd like you to share with one another a thing you ate when you were a child, maybe even regularly, that has just a sweet, sweet memory for you. Go ahead and do that now. Go. All right. Come on back. Come on back. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking time to do that with one another. So now you know someone new, and that someone knows a sweet little secret about you. So hold on to that connection that you just made because uh, it may be useful for a thing that I'm going to ask you to do a little bit later. Um, today I want to talk to you about side doors. When I was a kid, um, our neighbors next door to us had a side door that faced our house. And this side door was super, super sweet to me. It had a tiny little porch built off of it. And that porch, when you stepped on it, had a very unique sound. The side door was always open. Mostly when it was closed, it was unlocked. And that side door had a screen door on it that was the kind of screen door, and mostly because the house was darker than the outside light, it was that kind of screen door that you couldn't see through until you got right up close. And once you got right up close, you couldn't help but experience this incredible mix of the smell of, like, Dryer, uh, like dryer sheets and baking cookies. And every time when I got up close to that door, I could not help but go in. And every time I went into that home for most of the first 17 years of my life, when I stepped inside Don and Barbara's house, I got to step inside a different and step into sort of a different version of myself. My senses were a little bit different. What I noticed around me was diff different. What I found is important in my experience in their home was a little different than my everyday life. Whether I was laying on the floor, on the shag carpet, eating jelly beans out of their crystal dish, or sitting in the kitchen and listening to Barbara cook while I watched the finches in their little wooden cage in their, in their kitchen. Side doors um, are really important. Um, and really, what are they? Side doors are unlocked. They're very personal, they're very informal. Side doors are for friends. Side doors are for the people in the club. It's very accessible and very welcoming. I went in and out of that side door for many, many years. Now, let's talk about front doors. Front doors are like the genetic opposite of side doors. They're super formal. They're most often very solid. You have to knock, and in fact, sometimes they have a 17-pound knocker installed on them just to tell you, you better knock. <laughs> it's the place where people come to sell you things. It's the place where you have your address so the EMS can find you. It's the place that your friends get dressed up and come visit you on invite. And when you're at a front door, you dare not cross the threshold without the universally recognizable signal of, come on in. And once you cross that threshold, you know you're in somebody else's home. I really love um, this metaphor of a side door as a way of thinking about an access point into your own genius, an access point into the way that you do your work, into the thing that when you step into the time to do your work and you look out at the landscape of your work and you identify what is important for me to pay attention to in this moment. That little side door we use to step into not just doing the work but how we do it in a way that is uniquely ours. As a communications coach, um, I have had an extraordinary number of coaching sessions in about 18 years of doing this work. 
And I've worked with entrepreneurs, uh, artists, world leaders. I've worked with, on a couple of Olympic bids, I've worked with uh, CEO types. I've worked with high potential young people across the board. Every time we sit down to do the job that is what I feel like is my calling, to, which is really to help that person I'm working with identify, articulate, and deliver their life's work story in front of an audience. Every time I do that work, there, there tends to be, yes, a part of the conversation that is about their work output, what they actually did in the body of their work. But more often than not, what ends up being the juice of the story is how they did it. And sometimes it is beautiful and unlikely and in surprising ways that they got to the thing that they got to in their body of work. And really that little how is what I like to think of as a side door. So um, in every engagement I do, there is that side door worth recognizing. And I can see that side door in my coaching conversations coming around the corner because usually it's set up with some kind of quick disclaimer. Some sort of like, you know, this is just this thing I do and maybe, we, maybe it's not, it doesn't matter, but I feel like I should tell you about it. It's this little thing where it's like a setup before somebody tells me their dirty little secret. This dirty little secret though, once it's claimed and integrated into the narrative of their work story, of their life's work, becomes instead, again, the powerhouse of their story, the absolute genius of the story. And it is undeniable, we, we often will notice like, oh no, we can't talk about what you did, we gotta talk about how you did it, because it is, it is the life force of their story. So today what I'd like to do is two things. I'd like to share with you a few of the side doors that I've encountered in my coaching career, and then secondly, I'd like to pose this question to you. What might be your side door? Maybe you have many side doors, little tiny Alice in Wonderland side doors. Maybe some of them are the, side of, the size of this wall beside me. The thing is, these side doors can be a little bit tricky. And maybe already you're like, yes, I can, I can list off five of the side doors that I have, no problem. And others of you might be saying, wow, in the, in the mystery of my work approach, which ones can I claim? And I'll give you two little, two little hints, things that I've seen, uh, that'll tell you, like, give you a clue to what maybe your side door is. First, it usually embarrasses us. It can give us a little pinch or a pang when you share it with somebody, because it's this big elaborate side door that feels disproportionate to the tiny little task at hand. Or maybe it's a teeny tiny silly thing you do for an incredibly demanding request that you have coming down the pipeline either from yourself or from a client. These side doors can make you feel a little bit silly maybe about yourself and give you that little like, uh, like it might be a little bit of a dirty little secret. So that's one little clue. Second little clue is this. It can make you feel a little bit like an imposter. It can, it, in fact, it can be part of your origin story. It can come from your origin story that makes you, that, and it, that, the fact that it comes from outside of your current discipline can make you feel like it doesn't quite belong, again, giving you that little bit of pinch. But in fact, the fact that your side door doesn't belong in the very front door part of your discipline is in fact its genius, is in fact its magic, and it's the thing that I'd like to ask you to incorporate into your everyday recognition of how you get into what you do so well. So what I'm asking, I guess, in this moment is to take this thing that we hold close, this dirty little secret, this thing that maybe is invisible to others, invisible to us, or maybe invisible to others and still invisible to us because it's too close, it's too integrated, and instead claim it and make that, uh, make that thing that is invisible visible. So I'd like to now to give you a few examples that I've encountered in my life. Um, now, you might be asking in some of these examples, like, well, what? What is, what is a side door? What, what, is it, what are you actually talking about? Is it a physical side door? No, it, it's not. It could be many things. Here are a couple of examples um, of side doors that I've seen. It can be a perspective that you intentionally step into when it's time to do your work. It is an activity you engage in that helps get you there. It can be a phrase or a mantra that you hold close to you as you engage in your work. It can be a process, and I'm not talking about the broader creative process, but it might be that you put your socks on backwards, you put your, your 
pants on frontwards, you walk around the block for a while, you look up at the sky, and then you're ready to go. It could be an approach. It could be a metaphor, which is something I really love. This is one of my favorites. It could be a context you place yourself in that can help you really get there. It could be a structure. Here's an example of a simple structure. This is a good friend of mine who uh, owns a small uh, digital storytelling agency. Um, and she hates doing the business end of her business. Absolutely hates it. And so what she did is she took a big fat black paintbrush and she drew, painted on the wall behind the orange chair that she sits in when she does the business end of her business, she painted an enormous crown so that when she sits in that chair, she steps into the role of queen. And when she steps into the role of queen and looks out at the vast set of emails and scopes of work and, and, <laughs> and collections she has to do, she can do it in a way that is like a queen and that she can look across, look out over her land and identify what is important in the way I run my business and what to me is not important. A simple and silly example of a structure that gives her an access point into her genius. Now, um, she articulates as, it, as the weird that helps her connect to something that's hard for her to connect to. So I'm going to give you a few examples that come out of my coaching experience. This first one I'm calling the doctor's side door. So um, a handful of years ago, I was asked to come do a coaching engagement, a communications coaching engagement, for a gentleman who was going to be receiving a, um, a sort of a global citizen award for his work, um, for, for his life's work, basically. And he was going to be, uh, he was receiving this award for a hospital that he had set up. Um, and he, in, when he was going to be receiving this award, the room was going, is a vast room, very formal, was half full of the UN delegation and half full of uh, various business leaders, some spiritual leaders actually, um, top line philanthropists and global CEOs. And we were, we were given an hour to work on helping him deliver a pre-written, pre-approved, pre-approved, pre-loaded, telepromptered acceptance speech. It was a hundred percent front door moment. So um, just for some context, uh, this man was being recognized for his work in building a hospital and a healing center in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where he um, brought aid, medical aid and healing to women and girls who had been, who, who had been victims of institutional sexual abuse as part of, and sexual uh, violence as part of the deep unrest in that region. He had built a hospital that did, he was an OBGYN and surgeon, and he had built a, a, he had built a model that he was being recognized for that took, that took uh, the healing out of just the medical context and into the whole heart context. He built a hospital where he'd sew these women up, heal their bodies, and then place them in group homes together where through psychosocial support, music therapy, and other things, they could heal their whole selves so that when they went back home, they could bring themselves with their bodies and not just their bodies as a shell of themselves. An incredible model and very pioneering in his space. When this man walked into our private coaching room, I was overcome. I know he's not this big, because I've seen him again since, but he seemed nine feet tall. It seemed like he was ducking under, under the doorway just to make his way into the room. He was just this big, beautiful, well-dressed black man with this incredible uh, French Congolese accent and these gentle eyes, and I was sweetly, sweetly intimidated. I knew we only had an hour, and so I quickly dug deep and asked him, a question that would help give us a place to start, which is tomorrow when you accept this speech, what is the one thing that you are most nervous about, the thing that you are most afraid of in your short time on stage? And he said to me, the thing I'm most afraid of, Dia, is that I will shed tears in front of that room on stage in that moment. 
And I, it didn't make sense to me, because how could that be? Look at you, you're this big, beautiful, charismatic man. And of course, of course, he is also a human being. So as we got into the conversation a little bit deep, more deeply, it became clear that the reason that he was able to create the model that he did was his simple side door, which is that he was willing to break his own heart. He was willing not to just triage these women's bodies, but to expose himself to these incredible, these incredible stories. And that in standing in front of that room, if he shed that tear, if he implicitly showed his side door, he would be asking the rest of the room to step through that with him. And he didn't know if it belonged. Well, you all know what I told him. I was like, cry, baby, cry. <laughs> And he did. He showed his side door. We all got our hearts broken, and it was fantastic. The VP's side door. So this, this coaching engagement actually happened this year. Um, a VP for a human resources group for a technology company that you probably uh, use on a regular basis. Um, called me because he had been invited to give a keynote at a very large industry conference. It was sort of the first opportunity for him to look backwards on his body of work and go, okay, if I have a room of 2,000 people, what am I talking about? What is the thing that is uniquely mine that I'm bringing into the world? I know, yeah, these are my favorite kinds. Like, yes, let's do it. So I show up at his office and, you know, five or six minutes into our conversation, because I like to get, I go right for the jugular, Five or six minutes into our conversation, he sort of slumps over and exhales, and what did I know? I was like, ooh, here comes the side door. And here it was. He said, you know, you know, it's great for me to talk about all these accomplishments, and this was really around culture change, the culture change that he had done at a handful of organizations, not just the one that he's in now. He slumped over and said, you know, there's this thing. And I was like, yes. <laughs> Turns out that uh, he uses a particular idea that he learned in the military. And this man is not the uh, kind of man that you would sort of think as the iconic, you know, military service man. He's sort of tall and slender and gentle-faced. Um, but the fact that it didn't belong in his discipline of human resources and culture change felt like, ooh, just gave him that side door pinch. But in fact, it was a very powerful side door. It was this idea. It was this idea of take the hill. That in any moment, a single conversation, a group conversation, developing a strategy or looking at overall culture change, he would come back to this notion of, in this moment, in the middle of all the noise, what is the hill that we're trying to take? And that doing the work of articulating that made so clear as he looked out at the landscape of his task before him what was important and what was not, and gave him freedom to play in how might we take that hill super powerful, and a little bit of a side door that didn't belong. Well, you know what I said. I said, we're going to make this your talk. And we did, and he killed. <laughs> All right. And really, I just say that because, you know, sitting in a room, it's not just the, like, what did he do? But it's what was his secret sauce? What was his way in to doing that? Last one is the engineer's side door. The engineer's side door I love because it came from very early in my career, and it was really the first side door that I ever saw in broad daylight, but I didn't really recognize that it was a side door because I had 15 more years of coaching I needed to do in order to look backwards and go, oh, that's what that was. So early in my career, where I really cut my teeth and got my 10,000 hours was that I taught this class. It was a presentation skills class um, that, I, that I gave uh, for both in the world of what we used to say, silicon chips and potato chips. It was a lot of packaged foods and silicon chips. Um, um, and I, I taught this class around the world every week, on the week, three weeks a month for eight years. Okay? It was kind of like my very own Broadway show. It was a, you know, 10 shows a week, folks, for 10 years. Um, the script never changed, but the people in the room did. And in this particular class, I had a man sitting down doing a bit of a skills exercise that, we'd give, that we give at a certain part in the class. And he's an engineer who a big part of his job was not just doing the work, but also communicating about the work, as we all do, in a format that we're all very familiar with, a deck, right? So he sat down, um, he sat down and was really working intently. And I noticed, he, I thought, OK, maybe this guy's offline and he's, got, he's dealing with some emergency at work, some email that came through. But no, he was in his deck 
fully in, to reference an earlier, uh, an earlier reference, fully in flow. And in our conversation, it turns out that if he were not an engineer, if he had won the lottery tomorrow, he would be a playwright. And I thought how beautiful that he gets to step into a little side door as a playwright because he saw in the world that everything is a story. And his communications moments to talk about his work were an opportunity to step into that writer self that he had and identify in his engineering projects all of the key characters, the key challenges they faced, and the drama as they, and, 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 and let the, the drama unfold in such a way that at the end of his project updates, people are throwing time, money, resources, budget at him. Fantastic. He, he was, um, he was a, my, again, like I said, the, the first uh, side door that I ever saw. And, and he was a star in that class. In finding yours, uh, you know, I would like to ask you to step into this idea of, um, of finding your own, your own side door. And I'll share mine now, one that sort of got organically, it was organically developed, one that is super key for me to doing my designs. And I'm not a graphic designer, I'm not a product, I'm not a product designer, I'm not a UX designer. The kinds of designs I do are learning experience designs, workshop designs to, that have particular learning outcomes for the people that I, that I work with. The tricky part is I can design a workshop and then it's 20 people in the room that all bring their own stories and it can get pretty messy. But it doesn't mean that I'm off the hook for setting an intention and designing some ex experiences for folks. So I use this. If I were, then I would what? If I were a certain way and a certain moment, what choices would I have to put into my design? So for example, if I'm designing a one day workshop and I get, and I know that I'm pretty, I feel good about the first half of the day and I know I send people away from lunch and they have a lunch assignment and then they come back and I don't know where to start the second half of the day, I'll ask myself these questions. If I were compassionate, what would I do? And boop, some ideas come up. I ask myself, if I were bold, what would I do? Boink, there's a couple more choices that come right back up. If I were brave, boink, I would they would come right back up. Now, bold and brave to me are a little bit different. Now, I, and I can also say that I use this side door real time. So you remember the, the, the doctor's side door story? When that man, his presence filled the room, I felt about two inches tall, two inches tall. And I had to ask myself real time in that moment, Dia, if you were brave, what would you do? And what I did was ask the question, if there was one thing you were most afraid of, what would it be? And that led us to his beautiful side door and a permission to share his side door. And my last one, if I were patient, I would, because this one, if you can't tell, is a little bit of a struggle for me. Now what I love about these for me is that I don't actually have to be compassionate. I don't have to be bold. I don't have to be brave. I don't have to be patient. I can just step into what it might feel like and to be that way. And when I do, a bunch of options, what's important, pops up in front of me. And then I can just make choices like I'm pulling fruit off of a display at the grocery market. It helps me jump in in a way that isn't so tentative, that isn't so trapped. So my homework for you today is this. As you go through the day, and even outside of this space we share today, notice your side doors. Claim them. Incorporate them into your story. And you can help the people around you by asking others about their side doors. And if you don't know who to ask, well, somebody sitting near you has a little special secret about something you ate when you were a child, and they, you share that secret with one another. That would be a great place to start. So my challenge to you today is to ask one another about your side doors. And I'd like to leave you with this. Whether you are stepping into your work, willing to have your heart broken, if you're standing at the end of a trailhead and looking out deciding which is it that is the hill we are to take, alone or together, or if you're simply looking around the world and saying to yourself, everything is a story, where are my choices? I'm encouraging you to shine a light on your own side door for yourself and the people around you so that you can continue to courageously forge your ideas into the world in a way that are uniquely yours. Thanks.